God is good. All the time. And all the time. God, God is good. Amen, my friends. Amen. A few announcements, as you can find on the screen behind me or finding your programs as well this morning. First of all, birth cards are in queues. Drop them off in the offering plate at that time of service. We also have visitor cards as well in the pews. If you're a guest today, we'd love for you to fill one out. Or you know of a guest who's here, make sure you point them out in the future because they may not be listening to me when I ramble on. Also, the giving statements are in the back of the sanctuary. Go ahead and grab yours on the way out today. Um, that saves us, if nothing else, uh, postage from the church. Flowers are on the table and behind the table this morning are um, from Joanne Ringer's funeral services. Marilyn Joanne passed away early last week, so that's where our flowers are from today. There's your gift tonight, 7 o'clock at the Parsonage. Um, there will be a uh, bonfire slash who knows what, marshmallows and s'mores or who knows what other things will be roasted. So if you see a large fire coming from the Parsonage, you may not have to worry, but some of the youth were on the, were on the creation trip, who knows what they'll try to play with now. Would wise because sometimes we have to rein them in. But again, that's tonight at 7 o'clock. If you'd like to be part of the church prayer chain, especially our email aspect of the prayer chain, email the church. Um, details are there on the screen behind me, just in the subject line. Make sure you put prayer chain there. And if our church directory, I know we're doing this again, but many of us move, many of us have different information. Your phone number has changed or whatnot. We're just asking that if you uh, look at just the directory without pictures, but just our mail, phone numbers and mailing address directory to uh, check off if it's okay or make corrections if they uh, need corrected and their sheets either at that door or outside of this door, even downstairs. Other events coming up this week, Smile for Our Kids. That begins at 11 o'clock Wednesday morning through 1 o'clock. If you're driving by Wednesday and your car becomes totally soaked, I apologize, even if it is part of my fault. We'll just leave it there, but I know I went home and there was not a dry spot on my body whenever I left here Wednesday. But the kids had a good time. The kids had a good time. Wonderful. Your Sammy's a handful. I'm just saying that now. Uh, I already learned from his grandmother. <laughs> Boaz Field, if you're interested in helping with uh, the meals for the Boaz Field group, drop that, those items off by Tuesday. The sign-up sheet is outside the church office. But it's a great way to support those who do the harvesting as well as the preparation for the, the Boaz fields where they raise crops for our local food pantries and whatnot. If you're interested in helping them, check them out, follow us in the church office, and we'll try to hook you up. <laughs> this Wednesday as well in the evening at 6.30 p.m. is our town hall meeting. Uh, prayer for recovery is being intentionally looking at those who are surviving and thriving after substance abuse. So if you're interested, that's open door, no cost, 6.30 this Wednesday evening. And as well, we have somebody we have to recognize. Alex Van Ward graduated from Mercer High School. So this morning, Alex, if you wouldn't mind coming up. And if you didn't know this was coming, Alex is coming now. Alex, where are you off to school? Uh, I'm a Pitt fan. I'm sorry, I can't talk for that. Although this year's football season was great for Pitt. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, not too keen on that. But Alex, congratulations so much. Um, it's just a small gift from us at the church to say, well done. It's got a Bible in there, that's why it's so heavy. It's not a real bar or anything. So, but, um, there are gifts in there for us and how proud we are of you. So if you can, friends, let's recognize Alex. And as we greet one another this morning with the hand of fellowship, if you have a chance, make sure you tell Alex how proud you are. Alex, thank you. So friends, let's bring one another with the love of Christ. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
My guess is us in America, we try to make it, or England, try to make it a little more palatable for ourselves. Here's what it probably is, Cal. There's what is a pomegranate. You all like pomegranates? Oh, yeah. oh whoa, whoa. First search, you should have seen the kids. No. Ooh. And then you describe it, because the pomegranate, if you get inside of it, you get those little beads. And I said, they're sort of like, they feel like, um, like those, um, like, when I went fishing, they would be like salmon eggs. And the kids' the nose is wrinkled, they look terrified. Yeah. Who wants to eat salmon eggs? Well, you don't eat the salmon eggs when you go fishing. Either way. And yet the thing is, is with them, you have the juice inside of those, for lack of a better word, little balls inside a pomegranate. But if you ever try to open a pomegranate, they get everything out. They actually say that you should open it in a bowl of water and slowly cut it open so that all the seeds fall out into the water and then the pit disappears from the rest of it. It's not easy to do. We have with the apple in our minds, and so it's so easy, just if I wanted to, but since I'm going to speak after I chew, I'm not going to do it for you. But you know what it's like? I go like that, chunk goes the apple. Easy to eat. Pomegranate is much more like an orange. What you guys doing to me back there? Joking, Kale, I'll bet you that's totally, completely mean, girl. It's more like an orange in my mind, because here we go. It is now on my watch, 11, 18, and 40. Ready? Let's see how quick I can open this thing. I started at the wrong end. Y'all are just looking at me like, we call this dead time sometimes. And, you know, for those of us who are, watch TV and they just have, isn't this exciting, watching Pastor Brian rip open an orange? Can you see how huge that piece was right there? Wow. Now, between us, I am not trying to drag this out or take forever. Because, well, y'all are going to be bored very quickly and this gets to be exciting. But how much longer do you think it's going to take me to open this whole thing? Too long. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we are already 30 seconds into this and y'all are bored to death. Not only that, but then you have to pull the orange apart and start to eat it. It's dead time, public speaking wise. More so, how much time do I have to reconsider eating the orange? I, I'm guessing if it's a pomegranate for Adam and Eve, and it might have been a fig or something along those lines, but most commentators think it's a pomegranate. Whatever the fruit was, my guess is in the fruits in that part of the world, it takes a while to get into. They planned it. They didn't really reconsider. It wasn't an instantaneous, oh, I'm going to do that without any thought. They've got time. Because I could keep on feeling this orange, but I've got time to reconsider, as I have. Adam and Eve had time to change their mind, and they didn't. My guess. Often when we're faced with that choice of we're going to get into trouble or not, you're often going to have time to reconsider. Scripture tells us to flee those moments. Resist the devil and flee. Sometimes, though, it's really just us who gets ourselves in that kind of temptation spot. Resist yourself and flee. Adam and Eve didn't. You and I, if we think about our past, we probably have a flood as well. But when we're tempted, and you didn't really know something, the thing you ought to do, look for that moment where you can leave. Because we're all going to face temptation. You're going to go through it in life, no matter what it is. Whether it's your first time going off to college, sitting in my office, and all of a sudden I have all that leftover children's message candy sitting around. Mm -hmm -hmm. Although there's only so much Laffy Taffy you can ingest in a day. <laughs> Sadly, I've tried. Yes, we're going to face temptation of all sorts. Too often, though, we act like it was an instantaneous choice. You've got a chance, most of the time, to change your mind. Grab the moment when you can. So let's pray. Father, lead us not into temptation, and yet we're asking, Father, as well, that when we are tempted, that you give us that way out. Open up our eyes. Give us the strength to drop the fruit of, the, uh, the fruit of our desire. Instead of do what you'd have us do. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, kids, thank you so much. You behaved so well. If I had an apple for all of you, I would. If you couldn't tell, though, there's only about 20 apples up here. This is better than Laffy Taffy, just between us. So, that and my apples were rated sun, or Wednesday during Smile. Kids saw me in my office, and next thing I know, I had like six apples walk out of the room. Little thieves. But don't tell them I said that. Wait, should I really be saying things like that? No. Well, friends, what would you like to give God thanks this morning for? What would you like to praise God for who God is? And what do we need to be praying for? Denise.
to be praying for Vaughn and Helen. If you didn't notice, they had a, they left early today. So if you care about them, follow up with them today, all right? What else, my friends? Sue? Um, our neighbor, Dorothy Maxwell, is going in for the replacement on Wednesday. <coughs> So we pray for Dorothy Maxwell, Sue and Ross's neighbor, who's going for a hip replacement Wednesday. Sue, thank you. Friends, is there anything else? John, first. The Moon family? Yes. If you had not heard, Dee passed away. I'm still trying to figure out if it was Friday or Saturday. When I saw her Friday at the hospital, she was not in a good place and was unresponsive. But Dee passed away. And so um, funeral service will be Thursday afternoon. Um, I'll be praying for the new family. That's just someone else. Marianne. Keep praying for Kate and Renee. They're still working on the paperwork to buy a new house, but they finally decided it was cheaper to buy than to rent. So. Okay. <laughs> so pray for Kate and Renee in the midst of buying a house. And Sammy, too. Changing everything can be difficult. Okay. And and they're in the process of getting prepared to be adoptive parents. Oh, wow. All right. So, as Kate Renee will to adopt as well, I'll be praying for that. <clears throat> Thanks, Marianne. Sure. I go back to the heart doctor Wednesday. Okay. So, we pray for Shirley and Miss and heading off to the do heart doctor's Wednesday. So someone else's hand as well, Joanne. Bruce Merritt has asked for prayers for his sister Celeste. So she's praying for Celeste Merritt as well. Okay. Thanks, Joanne. Well, one another and you. I'm sorry? One another, one another and you. Thanks, Walt. <coughs> Friends, is there anything else we have to be praying for? Mary Ann. I got a praise, and that is that the smile day works really well on Wednesday, and we'll pray for next Wednesday. Yep, I agree. 22 kids were here in the middle of the day. We had 10 leaders there, anywhere from grizzled veterans like Sandra and I down to quite a few high school students. Yeah, what a gift. Thanks, Mary Ann. Is there anyone else? Sue. I have a joy. Yeah. Uh, I was on the bus trip last night, or yes, last night, going out to the Great Wings of the Park. I had a nice time. But the bus broke down a few times on the way home. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, first service was saying something about that Vernon lady. She was out there playing. No, I'm joking. No, no, no. Nobody said that but me. But the bus trip for the Gateway trip from the folks connected to fundraisers and whatnot was a great deal of fun, except for that bus ride home, I guess. And God's safety still was there. Thanks, Sue. Friends, is there anything else? I have a couple here. One, um, Cassie appears from our church. She's at camp this week. She normally goes to the first service or is in the nursery. Praying for her, she's in a leadership role at camp. Secondly, um, I should be with uh, Joanne Ringer's family, or be praying for Joanne Ringer's family as well, because the flowers on the table and behind the table are from Joanne Ringer's funeral service that was this Friday. So keep praying for Joanne Ringer's family. And then Carol McBride, who's Sarah Calvert's sister, she's um, she's entered hospice care. So also be praying for Carol McBride. Okay, friends. Why don't we go to the Lord together in prayer? Father, we say it every week in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. And then we just sort of keep going by. Father, we come before you this morning almost in awe that you would forgive us. We may have entered this world that is a mess, and yet it's still a wonder that you'd forgive us. You are the God who could wipe us out with the snap of your fingers. You are the God who could completely remove us if you so desired. You are the God who could have the earth swallow us up, or a whale come and take us out, or a fish, really, I should say, take us out if you so desired. You are the God who can do anything. If you can rise Jesus from the dead, or raise Jesus from the dead, you can do anything. And yet, you choose to forgive us. 
for everything, every mistake we've ever made, every sin we've ever committed, those we chose to commit, and those we accidentally committed and didn't even know we were doing, you forgive us through the cross. When we say yes to your son Jesus, forgiveness is there. We don't deserve it. We haven't done anything to earn it, but you have forgiven us. For that, we give you thanks. We don't deserve your grace and forgiveness. But my goodness, do we say thank you. Forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our sins. And you do. We thank you, Father. For your incredible love for us. Too often we might be like Adam and Eve, grabbing the fruit and partaking, even having the chance to escape, and still choosing to do the wrong thing. And you forgive. Father, we've seen your hand at work as well. Not only in how we have fallen short in our own lives, but we've seen your hand at work in and around us. We've seen your hand at work, whether it was protection for the bus trip down to the Gateway Clipper last night and safety in the midst of the bus issues. We give you thanks, Lord, for the great time, Father. We thank you. We thank you for how we've seen your hand at work in the midst of the smile group with 20-some kids and adults who want to give up their time in the middle of the week on a Wednesday. We give you thanks. And so, Father, because we've seen your hand at work, we come before you asking for you to move and work. Be with Vaughn and Helen. We ask for this in Jesus' name. We're praying for Dorothy Maxwell. In the midst of her hip surgery coming Wednesday, we pray for her in Jesus' name. Father, we look before the Moon family and the Ringer family. We pray for the spirit of comfort and peace. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Father, we answer you with Kate Renee in the midst of her looking for a new home. We pray that you open up the door for them, let alone they're looking to adopt. Father, prepare the way, move and work. We ask for this in Jesus' name. We ask you to be with Shirley and Mr. Doctor's appointment Wednesday with the heart doctor. We pray for answers and guidance, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. We look before you, Celeste Merrick. We ask for healing for her in Jesus' name. Father, we come before you, ask for you to move and work in our midst. Be with one another here. We ask for this in Jesus' name. And Father, we come before you, asking that you be with Carol McBride. We look before you, Sarah's sister, and we pray for healing, Father, and we pray for your hand to be in moving and working in this situation. We ask for this in Jesus' name. We come before you because of your great love for us. We come before you asking for you to move and work. We come before you trusting in you, Father. We don't deserve your movement in our lives, and this world seems to be a mess, and you are the God who has not turned your back upon this world, but you continue to move and work in it. So we thank you and praise you as we pray, as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And we forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For not is the kingdom. In the power and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, the sermon text this morning comes from both the book of Genesis as well as the book of Romans. Alex, you're back.
the last, the last reading is from Romans 5.18. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in con condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, if you would, let's stand together for a continues to affect us, and our relationships with God are not the way they're supposed to be. This world's a messy place. Our relationships are messy, and not only that, we are in this mess together. Who am I? I am affected by and I'm part of the fall. And friends, we're in this mess together. We're in this mess together. Although I loved it last week when I said, who am I? And one of our youngsters here in church said, you're Pastor Brian. If you were here, you remember that. What a hoot. And yet, what a beautiful moment. So we talked about last week how we were made in the image of God. That God created us. We are the workmanship of his hands, or work personship, if you'd rather me use that term, of God's hands. Where God created us in the way that God wanted us to be made. We are works of art in God's eyes. I mean, most of us have been trained not to think that way. You know, what we talked about multiple times last week was this. I am made in the image of God. Can you repeat that after me? I am made in the image of God. Here you go. Ready? I'll go first. I am made in the image of God. Your turn. I am made in the image of God. I am valuable. I am valuable. I'm not junk. I'm not junk. That's, it's that simple. But the training we've had in our minds is that somehow we don't measure up. We don't measure up in terms of what we do or how we look or whatever it is. We don't measure up for grades in school. Whatever it might have been or is in our lives. We don't measure up as parents. We don't measure up here or there or everywhere else. How many magazines are sold trying to get us to look like something else or be something else? Just look at the covers of Cosmo or Men's Health. If you just do this, you'll have six pack abs. For some folks, it means lay off the beer, or in my case, lay off the Snickers. Or, of course, I'm probably losing a couple pounds. Or it could be, if you have wear this makeup, everything will change for you. Axe Body Spray, if you watch the commercials for teenagers. You spray this, and the girls can't keep their fingers off of you. I mean, that's almost the hint we get. And yet, you use those things, they don't fail. They, they fail. You put on this makeup, you wear this outfit, you think this way, you tell them these words, you say this thing to her, and it doesn't measure up. It's as though we failed. We don't measure up. That's the lie the world tells us. The fact that we don't measure up, that we are worthless. That's not what God created in the first place. He didn't create junk. No, I am made in the image of God. Good morning, I'm folks. Sit me. Ready? Here we go. Ready again? I'm going to sneak this in on you. I am made in the image of God. I am made in the image of God. I am valuable. I am valuable. I'm not junk. I'm not junk. No matter what the world seems to tell you, or maybe the doubts and the worries that go through your mind tell you that you are worthless, that you have no meaning, that you're junk. It is not the truth. God made you. And God don't make no junk. Read through Genesis 1. God don't make no junk. Yes, I know it's a double negative, but I'm just playing with the grammar there. Look at Genesis chapter 1. Every day, God said it was good. He created day 6 when he made humans. He said it's very good. That doesn't mean we stand in front of the mirror going, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm in God's image. Look at me. That's not the point. It's that we have value, not based in and of ourselves as much as based in the one who made us. 
God gives us such incredible value by making us. And then there's even more value when Jesus pays the price for us. When he died on the cross for us and rose from the dead. Forgiveness of sins and hope for life everlasting because of what Jesus did. There is more value in that than any other magazine can promise us. Quick fixes, sold magazines, 30 second news snippets on the Today Show or whatnot, the quick fixes. They don't work in comparison to what God has done for us. But one reason why we fall for the quick fixes, why we buy the magazines, why we look at the self-help books, why we watch the Today Show to see what else we may be able to get that fixed quickly from, it's because we live in a world that has fallen. It is broken. The world we are living in is a messy place. If you don't agree with me, watch the news. Think through history. The terrible, terrible things human beings have done to one another. Mao Zedong, Lenin and Stalin, here in the United States when Native Americans wiped out slavery. Think about it with apartheid in South Africa, and even today as Muslims many places around the world are killing Christians and people of other faith. How do folks do this? One of the lies that we're told is that people are inherently good, and yet... As we heard from Romans chapter 5 today, people are not inherently good. We've got a problem. One, we continue to sin, but two, we are part of the fall. Today we'll talk about the fall, this aspect of how we have fallen from grace to be in a broken world, and we don't help matters every time that we sin and don't measure up. Friends, this is not going to be an easy sermon to listen to today. First service, I almost felt... I'll be honest, I, I really felt almost apologetic preaching. I shouldn't be. The reason why the world is in such a messy place is because this is not the way it's supposed to be. If you read through Genesis 2 on your own, I encourage you to do so today. Genesis 2 hints at this beautiful relationship God had with Adam and Eve, with God had with human beings. We even got a glimpse of it in Genesis 3, verse 7 for the children's message this morning. Adam and Eve are hiding, they just put clothing on. And then they're in hiding because they heard the footsteps of God in the garden. And I've shared it before, but I'll share it again. Growing up, I, I knew it was my dad coming up the steps when I was a kid. And I knew I had to turn my reading light off because it was on much later than it should have been when I was a kid. When I heard my dad coming up the steps. Because dad coming up the steps, he was not quiet. He was charging San Juan Hill. He'd be coming up. That was my father coming up the steps. I knew it was him. Mom... I was toast if she came up the steps without coughing. If she did a, <coughs> I had a shot. Or if she sneezed, but you could hear her throughout the house. But you knew, I shouldn't have said that out loud, but someday you'll hear her sneeze. You'll, you know, you'll find out for yourself. I've inherited her powerful sneezing. That's not one of those gifts I wish I had. But I knew she was coming. If she sneezed or coughed coming up the steps, I had a chance to maybe turn the light switch off. But often she could even hear that. But I knew Dad was coming when he would come up the steps quickly and loudly. I knew his steps because I had a relationship with my dad. Adam and Eve knew God's footsteps. They didn't confuse God's footsteps with the angels that were floating around in the garden or the animals that were there. They knew God's footsteps because they had that relationship with God. Matter of fact, they were without clothing. There were no barriers between themselves and God. That's the kind of relationship we ought to have with God. To know God so intimately we know God by the sounds and the actions God makes. So much so that we don't have any barriers between ourselves and God. If you're like me, we still have put up the barriers. Adam and Eve shouldn't have had the barriers. As soon as they ate of that tree, or that fruit from the tree, everything changed. They called the fall because they fell from grace. If you read through it, Adam and Eve should have died instantly as far as the Hebrew seems to indicate, it should have died instantly when they ate of the fruit. And God showed them grace. Somehow, God, instead of letting them run around with fig leaves on, gave them furs for clothing. Where did furs come from? Most likely it was the first sacrifice being made for someone else's sin. God didn't wipe them out instantly. But suddenly work was going to be hard, childbearing was going to be painful, and because of that, so many other illnesses enter the world as well. Cancer, diabetes, genetic disorders, and whatnot entered the world at that point because of the fall. 
as we looked at even as, as one of us was talking about this morning with how the flu seems to change every year, we can see that so many of the aspects of the fall, they keep on morphing. It's not as though it's stationary. It, it evolves to change to adapt to us. We've got brokenness in our world since that very first fall. But it affects us. Now, some of you don't like me talking about this. We have this sense in our minds that but people on the whole are good, in spite of the fact of what I've just said. People on the whole are normally good, and yet part of the problem is the fall has affected us and what we do. Although we'll speak of this more next week, John Wesley spoke of this, this fallen part of human beings in a sermon on original sin. It's long. You may find it boring. If you can hang in there with me, great. I will post it to the Facebook page later today if you're so interested. But here is John Wesley. It's describing the fallen nature of humankind as written about in the Bible against the religions of the heathens, where he's specifically pointing out the ancient Greeks, like Socrates and Plato and whatnot, let the modern romanticists of his day, those who wrote glowingly of how human beings were on the whole good and just made some mistakes. That's not what we see in the scriptures. So here we go. But still, as none of the heathens were apprised of the fall of man, so none of them knew of man's total corruption. They knew not all, that all men were empty of all good and filled with all manner of evil. They were wholly ignorant of the entire deprivation of the whole human nature, of every man born into the world, and every faculty of his soul, not so much by those particular vices which reign in particular persons, as by the general flood of atheism and idolatry, pride, self will, and love of the world. This, therefore, is the first grand distinguishing point between heathenism, heathenism again being my side note, those ancient Greeks and his modern day romanticists. Distinguishing point between heathenism and Christianity. The one, Acknowledges that many men are infected by many vices, and even born with a proneness in them, but supposes with all that in some the natural good much overbalances the evil. The other declares that all men are conceived in sin and shaven in wickedness, that hence there is yet in every man or human a carnal mind which is an enmity against God, which is not, cannot be subject to his law, God's law, and which so infects the whole soul that there is well in him, in his flesh, in his natural state, no good thing. But every imagination of the thoughts of the heart is evil, only evil, and that continually. John Wesley, writing in the 1800s in a sermon where they were able to sit through that sort of thing. Most of you tuned me out or maybe took a little nap. But what's he saying is this. Human beings, because of the fall, continue to choose to do the wrong thing. As though we are marred, as though we are broken, as though we cannot choose to do the right thing. The scriptures seem to indicate that on the whole humans, even when we do maybe the good thing or the right thing, often our motives are so bad or so messed up that it's not good the way God would make sure it's good. The fall not only affects the world around us with brokenness and work being so hard and childbearing and illness entering the world, childbearing so being so painful and illness being in the world, but it's affected us that we don't even do the right thing. We were born into this mess. It affects us. We were born into this mess, and we're in this mess together. We are born into this mess, and we're in this mess together, as the fall affects us. And yet there's, there's hope. Although you're going to find this to be a strange place where I find hope. You ready for this? T and I went to go see Wonder Woman yesterday. Now, between us, I really I was excited to see the Wonder Woman movie, especially by hearing about how good of a movie it was on the whole. And it was okay. But it didn't feel like it was a good movie for a single guy to go through the movies by himself and watch Wonder Woman. Just so you know, that seemed a little strange. So I took my wife with me. There's a great ending to the movie, and it's actually it's worth the time. One of the better of the DC superhero movies. And for some reason, you just look at me like Pastor Brian. You went to see another superhero movie? Yup, I went. So here we go. The end of the movie, and in the midst of this discussion about are human beings even worth saving? Wonder Woman, who's hidden from public life and helping folks as a hero for a while, says this at the very end. I used to want to save the world, to end war and bring peace to mankind. But then I glimpsed the darkness that lives within their light, human beings' light. I learned that inside every one of them, there will always be both. The choice each must make for themselves. Something no hero will ever defeat. And now I know that only love can truly save the world. 
So now I stay, I fight, and I give. For the world I know I can be. This is my mission now, forever. Again, that's from Wonder Woman at the end of the book. Are human beings worth fighting for when she almost quits? But are humans worth fighting for? Because we can make such a mess of things. If you don't think we can make a mess of things, again, watch the news. It's pretty painful. But look, look at yourself and how often, even when you try to do the good thing or the right thing, how it can get messy or convoluted, or you try to see something nice as someone is taken the wrong way or comes out wrong out of our mouths. We're in this mess. And often we try to do something good. We're more like pig pen, trying to help somebody and get them dirty. In Genesis chapter 6, before the flood, this is what it says in Genesis 6 verse 5. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The hint, hint being here in the scriptures is this. It's a mess. Now, doesn't that just make you feel happy? Pastor Brown, that's such a nice word for me this morning. You formed my heart. You just called me a mess, and now I'm a failure. Not at all. Who are we? We are made in the image of God. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Let's say that again. I am made in the image of God. I am made in the image of God. Boy, we are, we're, we're falling asleep on me here, so we'll start it over again. I am made in the image of God. I am made in the image of God. I am valuable. I am valuable. I'm not junk. I'm not junk. That doesn't mean that we aren't broken, that we're not fallen, that we haven't fallen. It doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes. We do. And the world we live in is one messy place, which makes it even harder to do things the right way, with the right motives and the right attitude of heart. But there is still hope. The one I to quote, the only hope in the world is this. Love. Where do we ultimately see that in the first place? Friends, we're in this mess together. We've been born into this mess, and maybe this just doesn't make sense. Maybe this feels a little strange. Maybe you don't buy what I'm saying about us being part of the fall. But this is the, the story I came up with that might help. For me, growing up, I never had a mouse in the house. In our house, we up, we never had a mouse. Now, I grew up in the suburbs, so it wasn't like we were in farm country, but I never had a mouse in the house. Here's why. Sinbad. Now you're going to think the pirate lived at your house? No. We ended up getting a barn cat from a neighbor named Sinbad. Sinbad had a black coat, white belly, white paws. Look cool. As a matter of fact, Sinbad walked from the neighborhood and Sinbad strutted. This cat was one bad mama, except Sinbad was a male, of course. He was. A, I mean, they say normally female cats are the better hunters. I would put this cat up against any hunter. There would be days where you have multiple gifts left by the cat. No. You know what I'm talking about? Mice. Rabbits, chipmunks, he took out moles like no other, and then there were bigger creatures that showed up at times. Birds, mom was livid when the robins started showing up. He took out rabbits. There, I would deliver newspapers in the morning, and I, more than once I'd be a mile from my house growing up, and I'd look behind me, and there's this black and white cat following me. He's playing hide and seek. There'd be Halloween nights where he would just follow us around as we collected candy. That, no, that wasn't when I was 25. I mean, when I was a kid, that's what it was. And yet, that barn cat never really left him. More than once, my sister decided that she'd dress him up in some of her baby doll clothes. Yeah, no cat wants to wear pink. But this cat definitely didn't. I think she still has scars from the days where he let her know his displeasure. There was a day where one of our neighbor's uh, sons brought home his German Shepherd puppy, I believe because I'm, it was about a year old or so, but the German Shepherd came down, was loose from their yard, came down and sniffed at Sinbad the cat who was in our yard. Sniffed the cat, went to play a bit, and next thing I know, Sinbad the cat is on top of the German Shepherd puppy, claws entrenched into his back, and then he wrote this, let me get it right, Bucking Bronco, I said Bucking Bronco in the first service, Bucking Bronco around the yard as he rode that dog. Never saw that dog ever come back into our yard again. That cat took out everything. We never had a mouse in the house. And then, when I was about to head off to college, Sinbad had to be put down. After college, I ended up having a job as a youth pastor in a small town northeast Ohio. It was a rural community um, called Thompson, Ohio. The apartment I had was over top of 
Lad's gift shop, and the gift shop was never open when I was there. Seven years, the guy never opened it for sale, but maybe two or three times. Nobody was in the gift shop, nobody was around. Fire department was a few houses over, the church was next door to me. That was it, except for the farm fields behind me. So guess what I had that started showing up? Mice. But the first time I saw a mouse, I'm thinking, this is wrong. There's something wrong with me as a housekeeper. Am I a slob? Well, I was. I was a single guy, but still. There's something terrible here. What is wrong? I'm a failure. One morning I woke up, and there was a mouse who decided to go swimming in the dish soap. He didn't make it. There was another guy when I heard a little crinkling in the kitchen, walked in, and there the lasagna with a saran wrap on top of it was crinkled off, and I realized it didn't melt because it was cold lasagna. I found a little remnants from a mountain, you know what I'm talking about. There should not be any raisins in your lasagna. <laughs> Come to find out, that area was replete with mice everywhere. But me growing up, you don't have a mouse in the house. I never connected the dots until I moved into Ohio. That was because of the cat. Never connected the dots. I saw the animals, but just thought, people who take care of their homes don't have mice. Then you realize people can take care of their homes without the super killer cat that we had in Sinbad. There was, you know, you're going to have mice. Because now I look at my parents' house, and even with the cat my mom has, oh my, we don't even want to talk about the mice from the leftovers and remnants. No, it was the cat. There was no mouse in the house. My experience was one way. But what is reality was another. As Christians, we experience life as it is in a world that's messy. It's a world that's broken, a world that's not supposed to be the way that it is. We're supposed to be able to walk in union with God. See God face to face. We're supposed to be able to talk with God without any barriers. We're supposed to be able to see God, and as the scriptures indicate, to see God face to face, we ought to die according to the book of Exodus. And instead, we live in a world where that brokenness is there. We don't see God. We don't experience that closeness. It's the fall. We're not supposed to experience death, but it's part of the fall. We're not supposed to suffer. Work should be easy but it's part of the fall. We live in a world that is not the way it's supposed to be. There was no mouse in the house. The way I grew up was not reality in that regard. We've grown up in a world the way it's not supposed to be. It's very hard to imagine a world the way I've described it, where you can see God face to face. There is no suffering, there is no pain, there is no cancer, there is no hopelessness. There are no, what is that growth in my body? There is no constant pain. It's hard to imagine that world, but that's the way it's supposed to be. Because of the fall, everything changed. And we don't help matters when we sin, when we do things selfishly. We don't help matters when we get in God's way or we ignore what God would have us do. Romans chapter 5, verse 18 puts it this way. The painful results of the fall. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people. One trespass means we all ought to be condemned. But, let's not miss the good news. We're in a mess together. That's right. We don't, have, we don't make things much better off when we get in the way. But, as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. One one result, although it's only it's an apple, one sin result in condemnation for all folks. One action resulted in justification and life for all people. At least for those who will believe, as we know from John 3.16. There's hope because of what Jesus did. We're in a messy world. It is messed up. We get in the way, and we know by watching the news how messy things can be. But thanks be to God that God is bringing it back into right relationship. We're waiting for the day that Jesus comes back to completely finish the job he started on the cross. But until that day, we're in a mess. Thanks be to God we're not left here on our own. We may be left in a mess, but we are not here on our own. The fall affects us, friends, and that's why the world is such a messy, pain-filled place. It's not the way it's supposed to be. 
But just because it is this way doesn't mean we can't live in grace. We can't live in hope. We can't live life to the fullest. If, if, if Jesus died on the cross on Friday, what happened that first Easter morning? Or did I just put you all to sleep? It's not an easy sermon this morning, is it? This is not one. Yay! Jesus loves me this I know. But the reality is I hope it's got depth and, and weight to it because, yes, Jesus loves me this I know because he died for me on the cross in spite of me and because of what I have done. In spite of you and because of what you've done. You've got value and worth, not just because you died on the cross, though, because I am made in the image of God. I am made in the image of God. I told you I'd catch you on that. Y'all just fell asleep on me. Awesome. I am made in the image of God. I am made in the image of God. I have value. I have value. I'm, not I'm not junk. He has not left his valuables to be on their own. We may have made a mess of this world. Thanks be to God that he loved us enough to intervene, that he would pay the price for us. Thanks be to God that Jesus loved us so much that he would lay down his life for us. So be easy on yourself. You will make mistakes. In some ways, the cards are stacked against you. If you're playing poker here, if you're playing Jin or if you're playing um, solitaire, where my grandma Keller used to cheat on me when we played two-person solitaire. It's hilarious how I get over it. I realize, my goodness, grandma cheated at checkers. Either way. Either way, it, it, it's stacked against us. You will make mistakes. That doesn't mean you ought to go seek them out. Oops, I live in a fallen world. It's okay for me to do this. No, don't be so hard on yourself, though. So here's your assignment for this week. Because we live in a fallen world. People are going to fail you, and you're going to fail yourself or others. So intentionally forgive yourself or someone else this week. Every time I say the name Larry Schmidt, I still think of the time in the meeting where Larry, almost 20 years ago, Tried to fire, had me fired from the church I was in as a youth pastor. I've been working on forgiving him for 15 plus years. I say the name this morning not to give Mar his reputation, but because I'm working through forgiving him. 15 years. The longer I go at this, the more I realize why he's said the things he said. 15 years. So be intentional about forgiving someone else. And it might just be you. We're part of the fall. That means sooner or later you're going to make a mistake. That's why this incredible love of God is so wonderful. That's why grace is so powerful. I mean, we are saved by grace. grace. I caught you this morning. We're saved by grace. Our salvation, it's a. Yeah. It is. It's not a. Yeah. Thanks be to God. We're in this mess together. The world is a fallen place. It is messy. But God hasn't given up on us. Thanks be to God. If you would, would you pray with me? The prayer is going to be on the screen behind me, but I encourage you instead to close your eyes and turn up your palms toward heaven as we open ourselves up as we talk with God. Just repeat after me. And so, my friends, let us pray. Lord God, loving Father, Lord God, loving Father, I love you. I love you. Forgive us. Forgive us. We've made a mess of your world. We've made a mess of your world. We've made a mess of our lives. We've made a mess of our lives. I have made a mess in my life. I have made a mess in my life. Forgive me. Forgive me. Thank you for your love and grace. Thank, Thank you for your love and grace. grace. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for forgiveness. I pray in Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Friends, continue to worship for the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
we may not deserve it, but you have blessed us to incredible degrees, and the hints of that are what I hold here. And yet we give it to you, as we thank you for how you love us and care for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. For us to sing together, hymn number 670. Go forth for God, hymn number 670. <laughs> Thank you. 